Friends, we come, I know you know this, but we come and when we open our Bibles, please remember that is meant to be linked with closing your eyes and saying, God help me. (laughs) So we open our Bibles and we close our eyes because unless God reveals his word, we're just going to be proud and stupid. And so won't you pray with me. Father, we do ask you that by your word and your spirit now, you administer your truth and your grace to your people. Lord, for those who do not know you, that they may be convicted by your Holy Spirit, that they may see God's big picture for all things and realize they're not part of it. What am I doing? Oh God, would you do that? I thank you, Lord, for the real joy of opening up your word in the context of your church, your bride, whom you, Lord Jesus, died for, to purchase and sanctify. And therefore, O God, would you use this little time now in the process of making your name great in our heads and in our hearts and through our hands, that, Lord, you may be lifted up with all of these brief lives we have, for your name's sake and your glory, such that we may say with the psalmist, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God's plan for everything. Uh, That may sound like a really ambitious title for a sermon. I wonder if you've thought a little bit about how the Bible is put together. That is, you know, 66 books, 50 authors, 4,000 years of history, one subject, the person of Jesus Christ. It's incredible. But, but have, you, have, you, have you ever noticed in the books, in the 66, there is kind of something else prior to Genesis 1 verse 1 spoken of in those 66 books, that God has a plan that he has between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit put together because of who he is, because he's a God of love, because he is aware of the necessity of the fall so that he may show his mercy and judgment, which would not be necessary if it weren't for sin, and that God's character must be displayed. Therefore, he puts a plan together for not just the 66 books, but for all of time, such that at the back end of all of this, he may be over here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, having achieved the plan to win a people for himself. It's an incredible, an incredible thing, such that there's a before and an after time, if you like. Now, if you don't get that, I trust this will be helpful for you today, that you realize God is who He is. A God of grace, of mercy, of justice and judgment. A God of compassion. A God who is God. With all the weight that that is. And that He will, no matter what, achieve His end goal no matter what, such that Paul can write what can separate us from the love of God. God is going to do it. And so, friends, turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 11, where I'd like to expose you a little bit to this subject, which I hope, having seen it, you'll see it all over the place, and help you understand exactly who, who it is that this God is, that we should love him all the more and rejoice in the bigness of his plan with joy, with real joy, and that we may be fueled on the inside to live lives in conformity to the image of Christ, but also under heaven. That is, knowing God is going to bring about his purpose, and I'm part of that. It's a wonderfully freeing truth. So Romans 11 Before I read, you know Romans 9 through 11, some of the hardest chapters in the whole Bible, right? And if you were a Jew 
Let's say you were in Rome. You received this letter from Paul. And you were reading it the first time. And you get to chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You might be saying, well, hang on a sec. There's a whole lot of Gentiles in the room. What happened to all the Jews? Chapter 2, it's dealt with. Chapter 9 through 11, that is the primary subject of, hang on, if, if mostly we're seeing Gentiles being saved, how many Jews in the room? Any Jews in the room? Mostly Gentiles, right? How come the Jews are so slow? I mean, they've had the revelation of God in the Old Testament for thousands of years. What on earth? How come they're not being saved if the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes? The Jew first, we're the Jews. Chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11 answers that question. And so when you get to chapter 11, verse 30, he answers Paul by the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit by Paul, answers this truth. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. It is the character of God. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. I mean, if you were to say, hang on a sec, God, I'm not sure this is the best way of doing it. I could think of a hundred different ways to rescue people, like not have sin at all. Like not have a fall, just have a garden and people, and we're in heaven, right? How would we ever see the mercy of God like that, knowing who we were, such that even angels want to look over our shoulder and say, I don't get it. <laughs> we do. We have been forgiven of all of our sin, knowing full well what that is, both the sin and its forgiveness, and how much it cost Jesus Christ to do that. That would not be possible. So, so when you read these words, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, you've got to say, how deep? And how rich and how wise and how knowledgeable is this God? Because you could never think of a plan like this. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Does God owe anyone anything? Does God have an advisor? You know, help me out, got a difficult situation. For, verse 36, and that's really where I want to go. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. If you know Romans, that's the end of the doctrine section. He moves right into application. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies living sacrifices. In light of all that God is and what He's done for you, serve Him. It's the end of the doctrine section. It is some of the toughest passages of Scripture or hardest concepts. But I want to say to you, friends, look closely at verse 36, because I would love to help you understand the bigness of God's plan. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Full stop. To him be glory forever. Amen. That is, these three things, from, through, and to, is directly linked to the praise and glory of God eternally. <laughs> so, let me ask you. If I were to stand up the front here and say, one by one, I've got a really big bucket over here. One by one, would you come in and put something in the bucket? And we're just going to keep going till we've not only got the bucket full, but we've got all things in the bucket. Keep on coming. 
Now, that would be kind of stupid, right? Because how do you put all things in a bucket when, in fact, the bucket needs to go in the bucket itself, right? And, and how do you take the galaxies and everything that we know is part of the all things, hugs and fritos and fizz pops and pews and carpets and birds, we're going to put everything in the bucket, right? So what's outside the bucket? Nothing, thank you. If all things are in the bucket, there's nothing outside the bucket, right? Good? Is that, is that, good, same page, good. Therefore, when you read the little phrase, all things, I want you to think of the bucket. That everything, that is everything, that you know to be something, is wrapped up in that little phrase, all things. Got it? So when you read the words, for from him, all things, there's nothing that's not from him. Which is what John chapter 1 says. Without him was nothing made that has been made. So, first point, he is the origination of all things, the source, the unmoved mover, if you know philosophy, the one who's at the back end nudging everything, atoms, planets, you name it. That he is here. There is nothing pre-God. He is God. And from him everything springs into being. Everything that you just put in the bucket. Including the bucket. He is the origination of all things. Now friends, you know there are many passages in Scripture that state exactly that. I've mentioned one of them. Can you think of others? What else, what other passages state that God is the origination of everything? Come on, here we go. Genesis 1. Pardon? Yep, keep, keep going. Another passage? Ephesians 1. Good. John 1. Good. Ephesians? Hold, yeah, right. <laughs> There's a whole lot. Come with me. Come with me to one that I think you may have missed that is really important and kind of a comparative passage to the one we're looking at today. That's Colossians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, before you get to Thessalonians. Colossians chapter 1. I have a bit of a backstory to this passage. Uh, we had, when I was studying college, uh, we were doing the doctrine of God, and we were asked by our good lecturer to memorize the Apostles' Creed. And a few of us, being good Baptists, said, the Apostles' Creed is good, but we think Scripture's better. <laughs> so we learned Colossians 1, 15 through 20. And when it came to the exam... Write out the Apostles' Creed. What we did is we wrote out Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Because we were simply making a point that the words of man are good, but the words of God are better. <laughs> Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, speaking of Christ. The firstborn over all creation, or of all creation. For by him... All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. That's like pretty much everything in the bucket, plus sun, right? No one said angels and demons. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created, and you'd expect it to say by him, wouldn't you? What does your Bible say? Pardon? Hang on. <laughs> He's been playing out the concept that Jesus is the origination of everything, and what he does is he then changes it right at the back end to through him. Did you notice that? 
In fact, if you have a look at that, you'll notice, for by him all things were created, and the next phrase is through him, and the next phrase is for him. Got that? Hmm. Does that sound vaguely familiar? It's kind of a similar repetition of Romans 11.36. Come down to verse 19. You'll find exactly the same three phrases. For in him... Now, what you don't know is the in him is actually in him. And the one in verse 16 is actually... For in him all things were created. That is, in him. He is the origination of everything. It's by him. Carry on reading from verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, there's the same phrase, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. To himself. There's the same phrase. Through him, to him. So you've got it twice in Colossians. The same repetition. Let's go back to Romans 11. Keep your finger in Colossians. We're going to move back. Romans 11, 36. For from him are all things. How many of you go to a school where you told that that's not the case? That actually what happened was you've got a little soup thing going on here and there's like a zap from nowhere and before you know it, Something crawls out the soup and says, hey, I think I want to be better than this. And they morph into something else and morph into something else. And before you know it, hey, I'm here. That's the popular thought. Scripture, and if you're a Christian, you will learn that this is true. Everything has a beginning. If you're floating in space out there, 50 years ago, by the way, they walked on the moon first time. You saw that this week? So you're up there in the spaceship, and you come across, while doing your first moonwalk, a washing machine on the moon. What would you think? Where on earth did this come from? Who made it? Who put it here, right? Because something never comes from nothing. Something always comes from something else. And if you have a look, it says DeFi, or whatever it is. <laughs> and if you go back here, our definition of God is the one who has no beginning, from whom everything springs forth, and all of it about Him, all of it for His glory. Friends, I say to you, you will be pushed hard in the spheres you move in as to whether you really believe that. I say to you, it is crucial. You carry on. God is the origination of everything. Whatever it is. Hugs. And you're going to say, what about sin? I have no idea. The Bible does not tell us. So shut up. <laughs> Secondly, God is the consummation, forgive me about the end there, the consummation of all things. For from Him, Romans eleven thirty six, and I want to go to the last phrase, to Him. I'm going to skip through Him for now, I'll come back to that because that's a hard one. That is, everything begins with Him, everything wraps up in Him. All of this is about Him. It's not about the washing machine. It's about the one who made it. Now, you're in Romans 11.36, right? Can you see it? From Him, for from Him. Now, this is a clarification as to how deep and rich and wise and knowledgeable God is. That you can't think to the ends of the thinkingness of God. You can't, you can't double click on God and say, what on earth are you doing right now? You will never, no matter how bright you are, no matter how long you live, 
get to know the depth of the mind of God. You are not an advisor to God. God, I know you've done it this way, but let me tell you, it would be so cool if you'd done it that way. Don't we do that all the time? And God says, you have no idea what's going on right now. Does God owe anyone anything? No. He's God. For from Him, so here is the clarification of that statement, for from Him and through Him and to Him is everything in the bucket. Let's go back to Colossians. We're going to flip between these two. I want you to see that these two are so close. By the way, implications, I should have taken you. Implications of that first point very quickly. Four implications. One, Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe, of all things visible and invisible, of all things that had a beginning, whether they exist in time or eternity. Full stop. Jesus made everything. There was nothing made that has been made except that it came through Christ. You. Just the way you are. Implication number three. I'm created by God. Just the way He's made you. That is, all your stuff that you say, I wish God had made me different, He's made you just like that for His glory, not your enjoyment. Implication number two. Creation's true unity is in Christ. Creation's true unity is in Christ. And lastly, Jesus made me just the way I am for his glory. So come with me, Colossians chapter 1. And, and I want you to see the play out of this passage. All things were created, verse 15, 16, end of verse 16. What you would expect it to say is by him, it says, through him and for him. Verse 17. And he is before all things, we've seen that. And in him all things hold together. Hmm. Hmm. What on earth? I want to say to you, friends, the easier bit in the Romans 11.36 is the from and the to. The hard bit is the through. So I'm going to put it last. And, And let's talk about to. But everything in the bucket is meant for the glory of God. Think about that. That is, God creates everything with a purpose. The purpose of everything is the glory of God. Everything. Even your suffering. Even your hardship. Don't you cry out to God more when you're suffering? I do. Woke up last night, my wife was in pain. Don't know where it came from. Put my hand on her and pray for her. No idea. That is, everything has its consummation in the godness of God, the character of God, who He is. And so it's not about you. You serve that, and you do it with joy if you're a believer, because you know that is better than this. I'm convinced of that. You know what you, you, know what you are? What I am? A breath. A little sliver of... In a, in a short space of time that is here today and gone tomorrow. And, and, and some may rem- remember you for maybe three or four generations. What you do with your life for God is what matters most. Here's the consummation of everything. Romans 8 speaks about creation, says says this, that everything, all of this, all of this is, you know what it's doing in Romans 8? It's groaning. It can't wait for this to be wrapped up and the glory of God to be seen and the revelation of the sons of God. It can't wait. So the consummation of creation is the glory of God. And not only you, uh, creation, but you. It's Romans 8. 
Believers, Romans 8, 23 to 25, listen to the passage. Not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons. Don't you? Do you know the first word of the Bible? What's the first word? Now, if you were reading the Hebrew Bible, it would say, Bereshit bara, God. In the beginning, God creates. Do you know how the Bible ends? How does the Bible end? Come on, guys. You know. Amen. Amen. What goes before it? Even so, come Lord Jesus. We're still groaning. <laughs> right, at, right at the end of the book, we're saying, Lord Jesus, come. That's why we sang the song we did. Christmas in July. Didn't, didn't it sound like a Christmas song? But that's our... Lord Jesus, come. Don't you do that? Lord Jesus, I know you're here, but come. Fill me with your spirit. I know this is really cool now, but I'm looking for that. The consummation of everything. Creation, believers. How about this one? The wicked, 2 Peter 3, verse 1 through 10. Listen to this, 2 Peter 3. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of, the, of our Lord and Savior through our, your apostles. I know this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days where you are now with scoffing, following the unsinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Give me a break. You guys have been waiting for, what, 2,000 years and Jesus isn't here yet? He's not coming. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by the means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. And the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You know the problem I have in reading the last few words of Revelation, come Lord Jesus? That is my prayer. But it's, Lord, what about my older brother who doesn't know you yet? And so there's this wrestle on the inside. Yes, Jesus, it would be so cool to see you face to face. Come. But what about those that don't know Christ? Don't you have that wrestle? Hebrews 2 verse 8 says this. That God has put everything in subjection under the feet of Jesus. That is, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit back over here get together and they say, this glory we enjoy is just so cool, isn't it? Man, it's amazing. Wouldn't it be epic if we could share it? How are we going to do that? Well, let's create, and let's create a people that at the back end of this story of them seeing who we really are, they may be with us and see us in all our glory, including this age, such that they may really enjoy who we really are. Let's do that. And they do. Your purpose on earth, why are you here in South Africa? Welcome Baptist today. Act 17. God has put you right here in the boundaries, in the time frame that you should reach out for for Him. And he's not far from every one of you. Here you are sitting in church hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
God has put you here because of all the time frames and all the places you could be, this one is the best for you to find Jesus Christ right now. Now, in putting everything in subjection, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Friends, here's the hard bit. We don't see the consummation of all things. It's coming. But you will. There will be a day where you will see all of this wrapped up and put below the feet of the sun. And the sun, in turn, 1 Corinthians 15, will put everything under the feet of the Father. And the phrase is that God may be all in all. Hang on a sec, aren't we talking about the bucket stuff? It's exactly it. In this last day, you will not hear birds saying tweet tweet, you'll hear them saying praise God. You won't have to work out how do the stars speak of God. You will see it. How does a fizz pop taste like God? You'll know it. How does coffee, all of the things you enjoy, all of those things, you won't be able to try and say, I don't get it. No matter what it is you do, no matter what it is you experience in the new age, it's all God. Don't you look forward to that. No more sin. No more trying to work out what is this. How does, how's God being revealed right now? I look forward to that. Implications. If everything is consummated in Him, Implications. One, everything that was created was created for him and that he is the sole end of his own work. I already said it. Everything is created for him, including you. Number two, Jesus will subdue everyone, every rebellious person, every agnostic, every atheist, and every knee will bow to Jesus Christ. So, thirdly, my future is Jesus. Have you thought about that? My future is Jesus. The future of everything is Jesus. So let's make that present tense. Isn't it? If that's where we're going, and you can do nothing to change it, why would you want to? Don't you want to know God now? So let's come back to the middle bit. Here's the hard bit, I think. That middle part, the through him. Through him are all things. And I do think it's the, it's the hardest bit. I put it that way because in some ways, this one stands to the left, and that one stands to the right, because this is the beginning and that's the end. And in the middle is kind of right now. Hmm. That is, that right now, everything right now is being reconciled to Christ. Let's go back to Colossians. Verse 17, He, Jesus, is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. There's that phrase. We know God's Word is true, right? That is, God who is true, who can't lie, said it, therefore that which he said is true like him. Does that make sense? Guys, the word of God is true because God said it, and God is true. If God were a liar, this would not be true. But if God were a liar, neither would this be true. Now we're in the matrix. (laughs) And now you've no idea what to think, and you get to Rene Descartes, I'm thinking, therefore I must exist. And you become a humanist. It's all about me. No, it's all about him. Because he's true. He's more true than you are sitting right now. Here. Here's the hard bit, friends. How is Christ reconciling all things to himself? Like this. In him all things hold together. Is that what your Bible say? I want to talk about two things. You taught at school, I trust, that you have the atom, that is the building block of everything physical is the atom. You know that? 
So whatever you're talking about that's physical, it's made of those guys. It has a center called a nucleus. nucleus, thank you very much, which is charged positively or negatively? Positively, positively thank you very much. It has a neutron and a proton. That's why it's positively charged. And around it, it has... Thank you very much. And they are negatively charged. Why does this guy stay like this without going... Or without going... How come that? Oh, and it's one electron for hydrogen, helium. You know the period? Yeah, good. Okay, one guy, two guys, three guys, bunch of guys, and they're all doing this. Why? Why? Because in him all things hold together. It is the building block of everything physical. Let's go bigger, shall we? Big fat sun right over here. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, whatever that guy is, Pluto. <laughs> and they're all doing what? Spinning, right? At just the right distance, in ratio between the mass of this fat sun and the mass of this Earth, at just the right distance and just the right speed, that it doesn't go, how's it, son? I'm coming a bit closer. <laughs> or spinning off into goodness knows where, all of them, all the time, ever since this was created. Why? Because Jesus is the one who keeps this all together. You know they do not know what gravity is. They know it works. They know it works with mass. But they have no idea. They call it a graviton. That it lives in things that have mass. And the more mass it has, the more gravitons it has. And they have no idea what it is. This year was proven, a hundred years ago, Einstein's theory, that there is no gravity. That mass like a big fat ball on a sheet, bends space and time flying around it. And that as things come closer, they come in and spin past. There is no such thing as gravity. What on earth? How does this all work? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is the thing that holds it all together. There it is in your Bible. And if it's true of the physical, how much more so of the spiritual? Amen. Not less so, because that's where God lives, right? Does he live here less? No, he doesn't. Oh, yes, he's there physically, but doesn't he call his church my body? Don't you do the works of God? Kind of, right? So here we go. This, I say to you, is how this works. That God reconciles all things to himself. One, in that Jesus sustains everything. Everything. Jesus keeps it together. Because this is going in a particular direction under his control. That's why he's keeping it together. History. You, your life, your parents, what you were taught at school or not. When you leave here, the route you take and the cars you cross, all of it put together way back over here. Psalm 139 verse, is it 16? All my days are written up in your book, O God, before one of them came to be. How on earth? Because he's God. That's how. And he sustains it all to that end. Secondly, what is curious about Colossians is you'd expect him to speak about the physical. He is before all things and in him all things hold together, which is true. 
And he is the head of the body, the church. What he does next is he speaks about the spiritual. That he is the sustainer of everything that is physical, and most especially that which is spiritual, his bride. He is the head. And therefore, friends, I say to you, there is a direct link between the physical and the spiritual. Don't separate them like it doesn't count for what's to come. It does count. Jesus Christ is the sustainer of everything, not just physical, but spiritual too. And the expression that that plays out most supremely is Christ's headship in the church. That is, the sustaining grace in the world is his bride. Wow. That is, you are meant to be on mission for God. You're meant to live lives under the angels and demons that shows Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be Number one, preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, there's that phrase, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. How? By making peace by the blood of his cross. How does God reconcile everything to himself? by Jesus Christ, by the cross, by peace with God, not just by atoms and cosmos, but by you coming to faith in Jesus Christ and saying, Lord Jesus, this is all about you. Everything is about you, especially my life. Use it for your glory. I want to say, friends, this is God's plan for everything. Beginning end, and you right now today, that middle bit, that God is the reconciliation of your sinful anti-godness that plays out in anti-God actions, Jesus Christ says to you today, be reconciled to me now. And if you don't, you will be reconciled to me here. Do it now. Do you know how God reconciles anti-God enemies to himself in that last day? Do you know how it happens? He displays his justice most supremely by saying, depart from me, you evildoers. You wanted nothing to do with me in life. I want nothing to do with you now. You will not want to be with God because of your anti-God state. You're not made alive for God. You you can be made alive to God right now, though. How do you do that? That middle part, God is the reconciliation of all things. You know what it doesn't say? Is that you are the reconciliation to God. It says God has taken the initiative to make a plan for you to be part of his people such that you may also be here in that last day by the cross of Christ. Repent and believe. That's how it works. Lord Jesus Christ, you came and died on a cross 2,000 years ago to win a people for yourself, some of whom are right now in this building. Would you make me one of those too? Thank you, God, that everything wraps up in you. I want that to be me as well. Friends, that's called repentance. That's saying, I turn away from my own stupidity and my own life and my own plans, and I do what you want me to do. Z22 or Z27, whatever the plan is. I do what you want me to do. And Lord Jesus, I'm saying now, come and be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for my sin and make this life about you as well. That's how God reconciles right now, by peace through his blood. And that offer of salvation is given to all of you. Friends, come, come. You who have no money, come, come, come and eat. Without cost, come. Friends, 
I say to you, there will be a day whereby if you continually resist God and His message of salvation and peace, He will turn to you and say, depart from me, I don't know you. And so friends, this is real. Repent and believe. This is it. Friends, that happened for me, I told you, when I was 11 years old. It was the beginning. I want to say that has happened many times for me since. Every day. Lord Jesus, here's my life today. It's about you, not about me. Would you be my Lord and Savior today? Would you save me from my sin and make me yours and yours mine? Would you do that? Would you make yourself the sun that I may spin around you, that I may look at you constantly and be intoxicated with your love and grace to me? Would you do that for me? Friends, I say to you, this is the gospel. Be saved. Jesus has accomplished your peace with the Father because of your anti-godness by the cross. And therefore, repent and believe. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, what an amazing God you are. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that you should put a plan together like this to win a people for yourself like this. That this day is part of your big plan toward that end, your glory, O oh God. Therefore, I pray right now for two groups of people. Lord, those who do not know you, who've not yet come to that point of saying, Lord Jesus, here I am. You know me completely. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross. Lord, would you take my sin upon you? And would your death be my death, or rather my death be yours? And Lord Jesus, would you give me your non-sinfulness, your peace with God, your righteousness, such that when the Father looks at me, he may say, My son, in whom there is no wrong, I know that's not the way it is. But Lord, would you declare me righteous? Would you do that? And so make me yours now. Lord Jesus, I confess I am a sinner through and through. But Lord Jesus, you came for people just like me. Make me yours now, I pray. Lord Jesus, too, many in this room who prayed that prayer many years ago and who wake up every day and say, Lord, here I am. Use me for your glory. I readily say, God, make that the case. That your glory, that this big plan for your supreme honor and glory and end and majesty, that these characteristics of who you are may be fully comprehended, if that's even possible by human minds, even in that last day. And therefore, God, forgive us for our sin. Forgive us for our anti-godness. Make us yours completely, O Lord. And fill us with your spirit, I pray, that we may honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen.